This week, three sides of the coin, Chris Lent returns. That's about all we got to say. But he does talk about Japan, 77. Bill of Coins quote. Talks about the Dynasty Tour. Talks about the Elder. Talks about Creatures of the Night. Talks about the solo albums. Some really good insight from somebody who was behind the scenes with the band. This is Three Sides of the Coin. Talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Are you looking for official Three Sides of the Coin merchandise? T-shirts, hoodies, and more? Visit shop3sidesofthecoin.com. We ship worldwide. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. We're back to Three Sides this week. No lovely Lisa, but please don't hit the stop button just because of that, because we have an incredible returning guest that's kind of a tie-in to last week's incredible first-time guest. Um, But is there any KISS news we need to talk about? They, they added a second show in South America. Where? In Colombia? So good for them. Uh, yeah, second second show got added down in the South American tour. Um, other than that, it's pretty quiet. Oh, the boat is officially sold out. Oh, yes. So Lisa's so Lisa Lisa sold didn't out. out. Lisa's on the wait list. Um, the off the soundboard second release is officially out. We won't get into a great discussion other than I will just say I listened to it and man, it's a brutal listen and not in a good way. Oh, okay. Ouch. Yeah, <clears throat> tough, tough, tough sounding listen. Um, other than that, nothing much happening kiss, kiss wise. So this week's guest graciously returning for his third time. Doesn't but get don't a green you jacket. Do any comments? Doesn't, do you have comments? I'm assuming yeah. you don't. No, I do. <laughs> okay God, do you your job it, uh, hey i told you when i'm here and i'm part of the episode Hey-o. i'll always read comments you know right, it's when you them. two are alone all right so this one is one of my favorites because i know this person danny siegelman another out of this is from the uh episode with elise on the book that she put out another out of the park guest and episode can't wait to read elsie's book sorry not elise elsie's book this makes up for some of the clunkers and kvetch fest episodes y'all have been putting out lately thank you (laughs) but hey we admit listen you guys still refuse to listen to us when we tell you a new episode sucks you still listen to it. So whose fault is it? It's not ours. It's still one of my favorites when we told everybody not to listen. Cause at the end we were like, that's the biggest pile of shit we ever did. And that one ends up whatever it had. Like, Everybody's like, that was your best episode ever. Like, <laughs> no. But we're always going to tell you the truth. Yep. Um, Robin. I, I love said, that word Kvetch. That's a great I know, word. I know it is. Um, Robin Adair. What an amazing interview. Big thumbs up to you guys for bringing together El, um, Elise and what was so interesting is I loved her passion about the music. This interview is in your top five of guests and we'll be taking, well, I will be talking about this for some time. Uh, let me see. It's all like really positive. There's really not any hate. Oh, there's been, you know? there was so much love for that episode. Yeah. You she know, was a great um, guest. Can't wait to have her back. She was really good. Yeah. It, so thank you guys. We really appreciate it. it, it and get involved. Go to, um, the youtube page and get involved because there's some really cool stuff in here um and finally we see chief broken arrow has returned i haven't seen him in a while he left a comment uh so yeah get on there and get involved guys please so yeah. this week's guest chris lent is back for his third time doesn't get the green jacket yet but chris comes back to share his recollections of Japan, 1977. And we kind of expand from there as to 78, 79, some elders, some creatures. Um, but we do really focus at the beginning on, on the Japan tour. And we ask him about Bill of Coins quote, gives us his thoughts on that. Um, but he, he really kind of tells us when he thought the wheels were coming off the bus. When did things get 
start getting bad that he noticed it? And what was the one thing in history, looking back, he would have changed? So this is a great inner. Chris is always a pleasure. I mean, he's, he's got great insight to what was going on. Let it roll, and we'll see you at the end. Do you have something to say? Leave a voicemail or send us a text message. Call 320-515-4771. Every month, more than 50,000 musicians, industry professionals, and rock, hard rock, heavy metal, and KISS fans from around the world listen and engage with the Three Sides of the Coin podcast. If you have a new release or a product or service and would like to reach this audience, get in touch with Michael to discuss sponsorship opportunities. Visit threesidesofthecoin.com. Three Sides of the Coin, we, we can't be more honored to have this returning guest join us. Chris Lent is back. And I think, Chris, this is probably your third, third time on the show. Well, they um, say third time's a charm. There you go. Exactly. Um, you know, if, if, if our listeners, the young listeners have no idea who Chris Lent is, we're not going to dive into it right now, but go do some Googling on Chris Lent and you're going to understand his position in KISS history. And he's the author of probably the best KISS book that was written, KISS and Sell. Yes. Well, thank you, Michael. Yes. It's a pleasure to be back. So, um, Chris, we, we kind of, I reached out to you last week because um, we had Elise on, who was one of the reporters who traveled with the band in 1977 to Japan. Um, she just released a book, and I felt like, okay, let's get somebody from the KISS side of the world to join us and talk about some of the stuff that was revealed in her book as well and get a little more insight into Japan 1977. Um, and you were the obvious person to reach out to for that. Um, so let's let's just, Mark, should we just dive right into the big quote and go from there? No, yeah. I did. I did want to hold on. I did want to preface something um, because, uh, uh, you know, our guest would know. Um, Chris, I have an ad. It's a, like a performance ad. And before the tour, this would have been in early 77, it lists Kiss's tour of J Japan, New Zealand, and Australia. And again, it's performance. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a industry. Tour trade. Yeah. Yeah. Did, were we missing something? Was that, was that the original plan? Uh, it's highly possible. Uh, a lot of things were discussed uh, at that time, like they are for uh, many international tours to try and add a territory or another uh, part of, part of the, the world that's uh, geographically uh, logical to, to pursue. But it, 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 it probably was something that was just uh, uh, contemplated, but, but never confirmed. Almost like putting the bait out there to see if anybody would bite on it. Right. Uh, there were, what people often don't realize is that uh, Japan and Australia and New Zealand, people think that's all the same side of the world. Well, it is, but it's like many, many thousands of miles. Uh, it's, qu it's quite a distance from Japan to Australia and New Zealand, and the logistics of traveling there and the equipment and so forth would have been pretty daunting at that time. So it was probably scuttled for that reason. Yeah, I just thought it was odd because it's it's in an ad for I don't know if it's a cargo company or I, I, I'm just guessing. I mean, I have the ad in my collection, but it's always just went and we always went, wow, you know, I mean, because it, it that's what it talked about. The, uh, you know, we we're supplying Kiss with, you know, whatever widget or whatever it was. And, you know, we're going to be in these three countries, you know, on the upcoming tour. And I'm like, OK, well, that was one and done. <laughs> well, I, I, well, probably what probably when they made the ad, uh, they were told, "Oh, Kiss is doing uh, Australia and New Zealand as well as Japan." And then by the time the ad was printed, uh, that uh, that that idea was uh, was uh, already uh, a non-starter. Yeah, oh, for sure. Plus, I mean, uh, you know, back in the day, you know, uh, you know, everything was done with snail mail, and you know, they put that magazine ad months, you know, months ahead. They, they I'm sure. 
So, yeah, I was just curious if you were going to say something like, oh, yeah, I know originally there was and we had to do this, this and this and then this had to change. But it sounds like it was just, you know, just as you explained a few minutes ago, I, I was just curious. So so one of the things um, I think we learned from Elisa's book about the Japan 77 tour is a lot of stuff that was talked about back then did change even while you guys were in Japan. Um, and we don't need to necessarily dig deep into this one, but she, she was talking about how one of the big focuses of that tour in Japan was the recording of Kiss live at Budokan. And that was, was this- that, that was the whole plan was to record the second live album there, which as we know, Alive 2 was not from Budokan. Alive 2 was from the U.S. Correct. And uh, Eddie Kramer was brought over to Japan, uh, who was obviously integral to to that idea of being uh, uh, Im- implemented to to record the the Budokan concert of of Kiss uh, at that time. Uh, I don't say that was the sole purpose of going to Japan. That that doesn't make any sense. But uh, certainly one of the uh, major as you put it, focuses of, of the tour was once we were there and we did these four Budokan shows and we did uh, the other shows uh, in the other cities uh, that were mentioned in, in my book, as well as I'm sure uh, Elise's, uh, that was a, a, a real uh, important uh, platform for, for, for the band in the future. Do you have any any recollection as to what changed to say, you know what, we're not going to release what we recorded. Let's go record in the U.S. and release that instead. Well, these live recordings, it always comes down to what's the quality of the recording? How did it come out? Uh, was the band happy with the sound? Was was the manager, Bill O'Coin, happy with the way it sounded? To what extent could... Uh, production, post-production enhanced the quality of the recordings and obviously a lot of that was done on the first KISS uh, live recording yep. which was not 100% live, let's put it that way uh, so so those things all come into play uh, and uh, sometimes, uh, and I don't remember this specifically about the tapes from 77 uh, but th- there, there may have been some feeling that uh, it wasn't their best performance or it, it wasn't the energy at the Budokan that perhaps they were used to feeling when they performed at, at other venues. Uh, a lot of those things are psychological. A lot, uh, a lot of them are emotional and some of them may also be technical. So it could have been any of those factors. Well, and I suppose too, Chris, it's possible that maybe the songs weren't different enough as well because you just had live in 75 and here you're a couple of years past that. But they, you know, Alive 2 um, had completely different songs on it than Alive did. And I'm well, wondering your, your maybe... point is very well taken. Uh, I, I don't remember the, the, the exact track listing for, for the 77 uh, tour, but if, if the tracks weren't s- s- a, a lot different than what was released in 75, which had already sold multi-millions, I don't, I, at that time, the, there was no mass market for a kind of a, a KISS collector's item live in Japan, uh, uh, because a lot of fans at that time would have said, well, we just had these songs, why don't they do something different? Right. Well, well I, let, I, let's, I uh, let's also it. keep I can, in... I can clear that up. Um the track listing on the on the japan um vinyl or what vinyl, what was supposed to be the vinyl um did include you know a couple songs from kiss alive and you know i think once they they finished it they that was just it they wanted a totally different sort of package um for kiss alive too and they wanted all songs that weren't, you know, previously released live, which the uh, rock and roll, because I believe in, in, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't uh, the official title was supposed to be, because there were ads for it released in Japan, uh, a rock and roll night in Tokyo, I believe is the official title of the shelved album, which by the way, it was completely finished. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just tell you right now, I've, I've, 
been lucky enough to hear it. it it's awesome. And, uh, but, but and, I think, I think one thing we got to keep in mind is when kiss toured Japan, love gun had not yet been recorded and released. Correct. Well, there, Correct. there was definitely uh, a, a, a priority at that time that as much as they wanted to do a live recording of Tokyo, a lot of what kiss did was they would record these things and they would be stored for future purposes. The priority at that time was they wanted more original music with, with to to fulfill their obligation to Casablanca to come out with uh, albums, whether it was once a year or whatever the arrangement was at that time, with more opportunity for hit singles. I mean, there's just there's just so much uh, uh, marketing power that you want to put behind re-releasing uh, live music, mostly of all the tracks that had already been released and were successful. Uh, they wanted to, to be a band that it, it didn't just look at the past and redo what they had already done. They wanted to come out with new music, with new albums, new imaging, new album covers, etc. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I could, I could, I could actually just imagine. They said, you know what? Uh, Lo by the time Love Gun got recorded, they said that sounds great. We want that on the next live album not old material we want new material on the live album and no doubt that, that's what we ended up with you know alive two became the next three albums where alive represented the first three albums um chris so one of the big things that elise revealed in her book which to all of us as kiss fans we'd never even heard rumblings of this or speculation <laughs> of this she she discussed how first night in Tokyo, she and another reporter were able to sit down and have dinner with Bill Coin. And, and, and I realized you wouldn't have been there, but maybe you had heard these conversations. And she quoted Bill as saying to her, and I'm going to say this, quote, fact is, this is the last hurrah for the band after the Pacific tour in Canada. We record one more album, and then the band's finished. As, well, Kiss, fan, I, as Kiss fans, our heads exploded when we, we heard that. I, I can't vouch for whether Bill said or did not say that. And uh, I do know that uh, Bill sometimes uh, said things that were kind of uh, uh, flippant or it, it, it provocative getting uh, people to sit up and take notice. Uh, I don't know exactly at the dinner uh, what, what his state of mind <laughs> might have been when he made the comment, so I'll just leave it at that and use your imagination. That's a very uh, fair point. You know, uh, we, we don't know, so let's give him the, the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I can't. I, is it possible, he said, some flippant remark like that uh, to a young journalist just to, to get her uh, attention. Yeah, it's possible, but I, I wouldn't, I don't necessarily know that he intended to be taken seriously. Do you, so I never under, heard anything like that in my, in my life from, well, from Bill uh, before or since. So, uh, but he, 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 you know, he was uh, you know, very articulate and he tried to be uh, humorous and get, get people to pull down, pull down their guard. That was just part of his personality. And uh, I could imagine he might say something out of the blue that uh, sounds a bit uh, uh, crazy. Uh, and maybe uh, Elise uh, took it a little bit more seriously, uh, particularly because she was quite young at that time, that the rest of us would have just winked and nodded. Yeah, I mean, it was sort of like, well, wouldn't you have, you know, at least why didn't you dive into that question? But she wasn't a Kiss fan. I mean, she admitted she didn't like Kiss, but that was one of the reasons she claimed they wanted her along. They wanted her to come along and write what she really thought because they were really confident she was going to change her mind. She could be turned. She could be turned <laughs> into a, a Kiss fan. Yeah. Well, uh I, I don't think groomed. the journalists were, were chosen because they were necessarily diehard fans, and 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 I think that was was uh, reasonable. Uh, 
the idea was they they work for publications that covered music. They were widely read. They were at that time the among the more significant publications. They je they were guaranteed to write stories that would get attention about Kiss and get them publicity. And with a group like Kiss, publicity is everything. Even if it's a, even if it's a bad review, even if it's something very critical, some of them will will go off and 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 write those things. Uh, others, uh, you know, will write more more, more lavish uh, lavishly with with praise on the band. But uh, you know, the, you take you you pay your money, you take your chances. So you know, saying all of that maybe Bill's intention, and again, we can only just guess at this point, was to almost hope she would take that quote, run with it and put it into the press, which would generate, obviously, in, in 77, if that news came out that that Kiss was finished, one more album, they're finished, that would have been huge news in in the music world at that time. It, it would have been, and I, but I can tell you, I never saw any stories about uh, Bill making a, a comment like that uh, in, in any of the press that came out of Japan or any of the years thereafter. Uh, we also have to remember at that time that even if Bill had said that, uh, and let's give her the benefit of the doubt, maybe he said it not to be taken seriously, uh, she wouldn't have gone and printed that, uh, or not, and, neither, and her publication wouldn't have printed it either, because it could be it, it could be very damaging to the band it, 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 beyond being artistically critical. Okay, it's getting into an area where the manager says uh, something about the uh, the group that's uh, uh, very negative, and at, at that time fans uh, it really weren't interested in reading dirt about the band. They accept the fact that a lot of people didn't like what they did on stage or couldn't stand their music. That that's par for the course. But this is an era when people could could keep their uh, makeup and costume on uh, and have and have private lives without uh, being revealed because everybody in the press agreed not to reveal uh, sure. kiss who they were in, in actuality and take pictures of them. It's unthinkable today, just as uh, if, if if today some manager of a prominent artist made that comment, uh, even in jest at a at a, a, a dinner party with a journalist, it would be uh, on TMZ or something uh, instantaneously. But in that era, it would have been considered off limits. Okay, interesting. So we we know, looking back now in Kiss history, that the 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 wheels, so to speak, you know, using Paul's favorite terminology, the wheels were starting to come off of the bus. You know, things were starting to get rough within the band between Gene and Paul and and Ace and Peter, especially coming out of Destroyer when Ace, you know, they they brought somebody else in to lay down one of his guitar parts. What's was there? Did you have a sense that, yeah, there were things were not as smooth in the kiss world as they used to be? Was that was that happening in 77? I, I recall that. That was happening two years later, more in 79. My, my recollection about that period, 77, 78, was KISS was really at the top of the world. I mean, they were on a really uh, steep upper trajectory, and they were, money was rolling in, and they were doing these uh, uh, tours in the U.S. and in Japan where they were setting records. And uh, I'm not saying they they didn't have their their problems and 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 their private uh, uh, mis uh, musings, but uh, they were really doing very well. And there was so much work being done. They were all constantly touring, and then the Phantom of the Park movie, and then the the, the solo albums. Uh, they they were really preoccupied with with, with work for, for that period. Uh, I'm I'm sure that uh, there were grumblings. Uh, among and between all of the band members, but it's a band. That's always going to be the case. I don't. I didn't really see any manifestation of of of, of that of those problems until really '79. You know, speaking of the work, I go back to another uh, thing that our guest last week, uh, Lise, was talking about 
Paul talking about, you know, she mistakenly, or maybe, I don't know if she wrote it down, you know, Love Gun, Paul is, is, is stated as saying that he wrote that on the plane. But regardless, think of this. You want to talk about their workload. That They, they left Japan, what, the first week of April um, to head back to the States? Is that right, right about right, Craig? More or less. Yeah, well, by mid-June, that song was the title track of their next record, you know, to write the song, record the song, produce it, and literally two months, you know, along with the rest of the record, those guys were working their tails off. You know, when, um, when everybody's working, uh, you know, work becomes the preoccupation and a lot of the squabbles and and disputes and and uh, uh, tensions uh, you kind of take a back seat because you have to get the work out. It doesn't mean to say they weren't there or they would they would disappear entirely, but uh, work took over. One of the one of the quotes that Elise got from Peter when she interviewed him, and this hit me as like, yeah, I mean, it, it goes to what you were just saying. Peter was saying whether the Japanese realize it or not, they're seeing KISS at a special high point. And KISS was, to your point, they they were at their high point at right then. It was something magical was really connecting to the fans. What we, we, what we as fans, again, yes, there can always be grumblings behind the scenes, but we didn't know that. And as fans, Kiss in 77, 78, that was as high as Kiss ever went. I mean, they were just peaking at that point in time. And That's Peter real, P, Peter realized it. Well, they had worked uh, so hard to, to get to a point which they really never imagined they would get to that, you know, once they were there, they were really savoring it. Uh, and that, that uh, at least allowed them to have the disposition uh, to do all the albums and the, the, the performances and, and the movie and, and et cetera that uh, followed from Tokyo in 77. Was the, was the tour of Japan for the band, especially a moment of, oh my God, I can't believe this is really happening. I mean, it, it literally, it was just a couple years earlier, they were struggling touring anywhere they could play, you know, out of the back of a station wagon. And now here they are in a chartered 747 flying to Japan with an incredible tour, 5,000 screaming fans greeting them at the airport. Were they kind of kids in a candy store, so to speak, taking it all in? I think so. I, 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 I think that they had... Uh, gotten wins that the Kiss was really taking off, obviously in Japan, and there was something about the Kiss persona uh, that connected very much with Japan popular culture. Uh, it fit right in with the the Kabuki style makeup and and the and the costumes and and uh, the the kind of rock and roll that was very popular at that time in in Japan. And uh, they just went with the flow. Uh, it, 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 it was something that uh, was bubbling up under the surface, even though they were focused on performing in the U.S. and doing their albums. But it was something that was catching hold, particularly in Japan. And, you know, Bill O'Coin was very uh, astute about uh, taking advantage of uh, that situation and marketing it to, to the maximum. Hey, speaking of that being a high point, um, Chris, when, if you could even kind of be more specific, because I, I think most KISS fans, or at least the way I read the history of it all, it was it was right when the movie kind of started. But, you know, one of the great things um, about the Japanese tour are a lot of the photos that were taken, you know, behind the scenes of them without their makeup on, you know, with the with the toy guns and the running around the hotel. And you could see there was a camaraderie there oh there was yes and there, there was. when 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 did you really start to see the the biggest fissure you know post you know a live two tour you know going into the the uh the solo album period like was there was there a certain time when like you thought to yourself like wow these guys they're they're starting not to be as buddy buddy know. yes 
Well, I, I started to notice that uh, in the 79 tour, uh, particularly, uh, the show was very big. The production was massive at that time. And, of course, the, the ticket sales really weren't there in most venues. So that was really the, the, the first you know, leg to drop off the stool uh, that they had organized this mammoth production. We expected to do multiple uh, shows in, in, in cities uh, night after night. Uh, and, of course, there were very few shows where there were multiple dates. Uh, I can't even think of any besides perhaps New York at, at, at that time. Uh, the show was too mammoth to uh, fit into some of the arenas uh, we were playing and it had to be cut down, not to mention the fact that the ticket sales were dropping and uh, the show became too costly to re reproduce every night the way it had originally been intended. And of course, that creates strains among the bands, like why did this happen and whose fault is this? And uh, how how come uh, we we got uh, uh, talked into doing something of this magnitude and it's it's not what we expected it to be and then you know then the old uh, uh, misgivings and and animosities come to the surface and people start to think well maybe it, it, we don't need to maybe we shouldn't be doing this and there's a lot of uh, doubts that are. Uh, uh, put into uh, people's minds, and they they just decide uh, to focus on what, what divides them as opposed to what, what would unite them. So that's the first time I really started to notice it. And of course, there was the the Peter Chris problem that uh, surfaced toward the end of the '79 tour, having to do with his personal life and. Getting hopefully getting divorced in his mind from his first wife and and uh, uh, having a second marriage with with uh, the woman that he had met recently in Los Angeles, so you could see that when those things started to happen, the the, the personal issues came to the surface, uh, and uh, that sort of uh, set in motion. Uh, a lot of uh, undermining of the the, the Kiss uh, mystique and and the Kiss success that had really uh, been going completely the other direction uh, un until '79. Chris, do you think it's possible that the solo albums were a bad idea as far as pushing that? Do you think that that was part of why they were losing ground? Well, the solo albums w was something that happened because Bill O'Coin believed that if he didn't allow each of the band members an opportunity to make their own recording, make their own album, and give them each a, a, a solo profile, he felt the band uh, would, would have started to drift apart. So he, one of his uh, ideas was that we should do the solo albums because it gives the the band an opportunity to express themselves individually and uh, cult and cultivate a closer relationship with the fan base that each of the members had. Uh, the other aspect of it was a tr was a tremendous marketing coup. All of a sudden, you have four uh, Kiss albums on the market at one time, which is ne which is something that had never been before done in 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 the history of of pop music. So there was a perfect uh, opportunity to try and satisfy what Bill felt were the creative needs of the band and a huge marketing push that would uh, put Kiss in, in the spotlight in a very big way. And uh, it, it made all the sense in the world, but it, 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 was, uh, it, was, some, it was overly ambitious. Uh, probably it would have been better if they if they had uh, uh, not released uh, or manufactured so many albums on the market that uh, it ended up looking like a failure, even though the albums actually sold relatively respectively. But uh, four Kiss albums is not going to equal four million records sold. Right. Four Kiss albums is probably going to equal more like one million records sold or two million at the most which is in line with what Kiss has been selling up to that point. 
But I, I guess, yeah, and, and I don't want to blame it just on that. But, you know, we've talked a lot before about how in the late 80s, how popular hair metal was for the back of a better term. And then Nirvana comes in in the early 90s and the grunge period just suffocates and kills the hair metal. What do you think it was? Because to me as a kid, they were still at the height of their popularity in my mind from the press and what I could see. So when you start to see the numbers dwindle with the people not showing up to the shows like you thought in multiple nights, what besides that was maybe an issue that could have led to that? When you say besides... Well, like the Soul Albums was my thought, but was there something else that, that you saw internally that maybe led you to believe that, you know, they chose some, some wrong things to start riding down this road of losing some of the fan base? Well, I, I, I think with every rock band, you know, they go through cycles and with KISS having reached a, a peak in 1977-78, in uh, you know, it's really hard to maintain that peak when, when your fan base is very young. Uh, so when they came back and did the, the, the tour in 79 with the Dynasty having just been released and the, the solo albums the year before, uh, they were also imaging themselves in an ever more grandiose way. And and they were starting to do things like with like with the movie, the Phantom of the Park, and a lot of the merchandising that had come out, that was overly kiddy. So take a look at how Kiss uh, imaged themselves in say 1977 when they did Japan, and how they were imaging themselves two and a half years later when they were uh, doing Dynasty. You could see that it, it had gotten a bit, it had gotten very bloated. It had gotten very almost like on steroids, the, the imaging, the, the uh, grandiosity of it, the, the over the top. It, 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 was, it wasn't it was dangerous thing. anymore. You know, Kiss was yes, It wasn't dangerous anymore. It, it, it was more like an extension of Disney. Yeah. That's what they were. That's what they were. That's what they were seeking to, to, to achieve, or at least uh, that's how it came out. Uh, the, the danger element, as you put the, the aggressiveness, uh, the raw, uh, youth energy that uh, they symbolized back in 77, it was starting to become a little bit too safe for a lot of uh, their younger audience. So they would not, the young, so some segment of the audience would, would gravitate to some other band at that time that was a little more edgy, a little more aggressive, a little more hard, uh, hard edged, uh, which Kiss was becoming less of. When when you started to see this transition around 79, did things become much more difficult for your role, for management, for the people who were working on the management team? Did it become more challenging to deal with the band at that point? Yes, in part it did because there were so many people involved with KISS now. I mean, everybody in KISS had their own bodyguards. And the bodyguard is like a doorkeeper or a gatekeeper. So, so you couldn't just say knock on the door and and talk to Gene or pick up the phone because there was always a bodyguard there. So he, who was running interference? Uh, it's not, it's not so much that they had authority. It's 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 simply the fact that they were there and there was a there was another person in the way, and that was true with Ocoin management. He had built up this huge staff of people. And there were very, numerous echelons of people who were involved in production. And he had a person who was involved in, in, in supposedly making movie deals. He had a person involved in TV. Uh, and, and Bill had multiple assistants and secretaries working for him by that time. Uh, it, it became a, a it became you needed like an organizational chart uh, to figure out who to contact or, or who, who 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 you had to speak to in order to to get to the band. So there was definitely a, a more bureaucracy uh, than there had been before, because there were so many more people in the Kiss organization and in the in the coin management uh, company too. Yeah, that makes sense. It it almost sounds like as the band got more bloated, management got more bloated, and it all just became much more difficult to navigate. That's exactly right. The, the, the Bill O'Coin at that time, 
uh, you have to remember that back in uh, 75, he was working out uh, of an office with sharing it with Howard Marks uh, on East 55th Street. And then when Kiss hit it big, he ultimately opened his own office uh, next door uh, and had an entire floor of, of people working there. But by 1979, he had not one floor, but two floors of the office uh, in New York. Plus, he had uh, a floor of offices in Los Angeles. So the organization kept uh, expanding with more and more people. Uh, and a lot of this uh, was, you know, really started to bog down the 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 uh, speed that, that you can get decisions made and, and move forward on, on uh, projects with the band. Was that in itself causing... I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. Tension, concern amongst the band of, hey, you know, our manager who got us here is now not solely focused on us anymore. He's got no, but, all these no departments. Uh, the, 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 the Paul and Gene and, and, and Ace and Peter, too, they, they, they couldn't help but notice. It was not possible to not notice that Bill had really spread himself very thin. He was signing up one band after another. There was Piper, uh, there was Toby Bow, uh, there was Stars, and all of these groups were uh, taking time away from, from KISS, and there were more and more people involved in the company, and KISS noticed it. I mean, it, it would have been hard not to notice, uh, They uh, and, it, and they would make fun behind his back that uh, he, he was turning trying to turn himself into an mgm of rock and roll but none of these groups uh you know really took off in a meaningful way even after many years yeah meanwhile kiss is financing all of this ventures Correct. well yeah i wanted to kind of touch base on that i don't know if you have a figure or anything but that trip to japan they lost money correct i'm sure they did yeah uh, i mean the the the, the, the I don't know to what extent Casablanca might have subsidized a part of the trip, uh, the the the, uh, the cost of the the plane tickets and the press, the junket. Yeah, that that was uh, that was certainly something that that weighed heavily on the budget. So it's hard for me to imagine that they, they could not have that they could have made money when you have a junket of ten people coming along that you're paying for. Uh, but and also it, everything it was, was a value time. to it, so it wasn't. It was I, I, I couldn't say it was frivolous. Correct. It was almost like a loss leader at a at a, dep right. at a department store, uh, just to get you through the door. Well, but but on a much grander scale, though, um, it's per, you know, Dynasty tour did not fare well financially, and that's no. right when you started to have the, for lack of a better phrase, the come to Jesus moment. It's when you're going, okay, guys. Uh, what are we going to do here? And, and like you said, that's when a lot of the, the, the friction, I guess, the, the rubber hit the road there, I would say. Yes, um, to, to my recollection, the, the Dynasty Tour uh, was really when the wheels came off the bus, to paraphrase Paul. Yep, yep. And, 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 and I imagine that's when management was really having, being called into some come to Jesus meetings with the band where the band was like, what's going on? What are you doing? Almost like right or wrong, the band was probably blaming management for this. Yes, they were. And there was a big showdown meeting, which I wrote about in my book mm -hmm. uh, that took place, I believe it was in Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, in the summer of 1979, when they basically read Bill the Riot Act uh, and uh, he was uh, cut down in, in various respects. He had to uh, get by on a reduced commission, and a lot of the expenses that uh, I r recall had been charged to KISS, uh, they would no longer be uh, accepted, and the whole uh, compensation arrangement for or coin management with who commissions what and, and what is allowed and not allowed, that all changed uh, from, from 1979. Do you recall at, at that period of time, was KISS ever being courted by other managers to say, you know what, we'll uh, clean this mess up, come with us? 
I can't, I can't say I've ever heard that, uh, which is not to say there may not have been overtures to Gene and Paul, but they didn't share them with me. As you were writing your book, Kiss and Sell, which covers your entire history with Kiss, not just this short period, because you went on to work with Kiss through the 80s as well. Did you right. ever, and even now, do you ever sit back and sort of look back with hindsight and go, Oh, uh, you know, if we would have not done that, or if we would have changed this, would the outcome have been different? Or is it just sort of it is what it is, and you know, you can't you can't change the past. Well, you ever thought the, about the, that. The the one major event that I feel would have probably uh, uh, allowed for a different outcome was the elder. Had they not done that kind of a recording, uh, had they not put so much time, energy, and resources in, into that record, which was a, a huge bomb, uh, and that destroyed the, their relationship with Bill O'Coin because he was blamed uh, in large part for the fact that the album was uh, such a dismal failure. Uh, and it prevented Kiss from going on tour because there was no way they could go on a tour supported by an album or, or to support an album that had been complete, almost completely rejected by uh, everybody. Uh, and that was the beginning and the end. So if, if, if something, uh, if, if there was one piece of the puzzle that uh, could have been uh, removed, uh, that would have been the piece that I think would have uh, allowed KISS to, to continue at least for several years more, probably with Bill O'Coin intact. Would would it have ever been possible back then to not release the finished Albu Elder album? Was that even an option to just not release it, shelve it? Uh, I, I don't recall at the time whether or not Kiss had the right uh, to do that. I kind of doubt it. I think it, 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 once it was delivered, it was really up to the record company Perhaps they thought about not releasing it, but then they just spent all this money uh, to to uh, produce it. So it's not that often that that after you spend a tremendous amount of money, albums are are not released. It, is, it, 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 it doesn't usually happen like that. It's true, true. It, we just know that nobody was pleased with that album when it was finished. Um, no, and, and the 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 band the the band had serious uh, uh, doubts about it. But uh, look, it was their work. They put a lot into it. Uh, they must have uh, uh, gotten some satisfaction out of what they created, uh, and, and they they did what they th thought was the right thing. But it turned out to be the wrong thing. So uh, I, I don't. I don't think you can criticize artists because they they go with their convictions. They didn't they didn't plan on making a bad album, and perhaps by by some standards, it really wasn't a bad album. It might have been considered a pretty good album, but not for a band like Kiss. You know, it's a commercial well, yeah, business. Exactly. It, 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 was and, too, and she, it was too much of a departure from what the public uh, the perception of Kiss was uh, certainly at that time. Well, and with things getting as bloated as you said. Maybe it was something they needed to have happen. They needed to get slapped across the head to really realize that, hey, this isn't what the fans want. Well, that's exactly what happened. Uh, the, the record company was uh, very dismayed at how poorly the album did, and that led to the Kiss Killers being released in uh, European territories uh, within months. And uh, they insisted uh, to the extent that they could insist that the next Kiss album be a hard rock album. They wanted you know, Kiss to get back to what they always did. I, I didn't, I'm glad that we're kind of progressing in their career. Because I always had a question and maybe you can answer this because now this fits in. In 81, they went to Mexico um, to do, you know, some TV and stuff. And they ended up uh, going to the, I believe it was a children's hospital and stuff. And being, you know, you, with all the marketing and everything you were around, Chris, like, I always wondered, how does that happen? Do you, because obviously it's PR, but do you like call the hospital and go, hey, we got this band wants to come and take pictures with the kids and stuff. How, how does that stuff happen? 
Well, it usually it usually happens at, at a local level between somebody at the record company uh, who was contacted by a charity or or or, or a hospital. Uh, it, 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 and I don't know the specifics of of, of that. I, I was not in Mexico with the band at that time. I was not on that trip, but it, it probably um, was something that happened, uh, you know, almost out of the blue. That they were approached by some social organization or some charitable organization, like would Kiss be agreeable to coming to, to do a, an appearance at a hospital? Uh, because there was a, a connection at the, at the record company level of somebody who could uh, move it up the ladder and and uh, get it in front of the band to say yes or no. Yeah, I was. I mean, not just Kiss, but you know, other because there's been other rock groups have done stuff like that, and I was always kind of curious, you know, how the PR person would reach out for that. I don't know if that was something that you did. Hey, one of the one of the chapters I really enjoyed in your book, and I know I this is whatever, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, but that learning to love the third world and everything that went on with the creatures tour, how did that end up, you know, finance wise for them? Um, were all, you know, that, that huge show they did, um, or a lot of gate crashers or, I mean, did they make money on those shows? Well, the the Brazil tour, for a host of reasons, was a, a financial uh, calamity uh, because uh, they were there were not the amount of shows that we had originally expected, and we had pro we had serious problems at the end of the tour, which re required us to run up a lot of expenses because the promoter had stolen the equipment. Yeah, I remember that. So, but I, I so just, there was a cost though. attached to the tour, which was not contemplated at the at the beginning. Uh, but the problem with the the, the Brazil tour at at that time was uh, we were playing uh, very primitive arenas and outdoor venues. Uh, there was no such thing as you know crowd control or security control or gate control. I mean, I, I assume they printed tickets. How many of them were honored or, or how many people came without tickets is impossible to, to, to imagine. I spoke was, to somebody on one of the KISS cruises from, from that area, and they said there was a whole – I mean, it, obviously, it's the video shows, uh, the, especially the one Brazil show that's on KISSology. You know, people just seem to go on and on and on. I mean, a couple hundred thousand people. But what he was telling me is there was a lot of people who just – got in you know what i mean i'm sure uh, that's like true i mean it's th this was like the wild west of touring uh you know they had they had tickets they sold tickets but that didn't mean that people couldn't get in who didn't have tickets because uh, it can't always be controlled and they didn't have the the manpower or the personnel uh to to keep people out and also in a country like that uh, you know, there's another side to it, and that is, uh, if if there's so many people that want to get in and and, and they don't have a ticket, uh, maybe it's better to let them get in rather than have a riot. Right. It's like Woodstock. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In in many ways, Tommy, um, that that's absolutely right. What what you know, just as a business owner though, because those are some very lean year. Well, put it this way: from '79, you know, they didn't. Uh, you know, they toured Australia. I'm sure that that did well financial, I would think. Um, but the, they had some years, straight years in a row where they the corporation couldn't have made money. Um, well, they had a lot of uh, they, they had a lot of tours uh, during that period that the, they didn't make m much money selling the tickets. They did make money on merchandise. They did make money on licensing. And of course, they had they, they had many years where they had royalties coming in. Uh, from sales from years earlier uh, that were significant. And, and they had a, a guarantee with the, the Polygram contract at, at that time that gave them a seven-figure advance uh, for every new album that, that they made, which is why they made uh, an album almost like clockwork year after year after year. It was a guaranteed source of, of uh, I forgot the exact number, but it varied between one and two million dollar advance per album. So 
there was money coming in, but it was a lot less because, as you say, those tours, you know, weren't doing the kind of ticket sales that were being done back in 76 and 77. Uh, everything was scaled down, but there was still money coming in for merchandise, particularly tied to the tours. And, of course, the, the back royalties uh, from sales of the records years earlier and the advances from sales of, uh, the, uh, of albums that were being made currently. Chris, were you close enough, because um, I don't know exactly what year this was, when, you know, because Peter was also, they kept pay paying Peter throughout, what, most of the 80s? Um, yeah, they 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 were paying uh, Peter. He was getting a piece of the of the uh, of the pie. Yes. Do you know what year that ended? Well, that's a very good question. My recollection is it it, it must have ended somewhere around the uh, the mid nineteen eighties because by then we were having a lot of financial problems, and uh, the continuing obligation to Peter. Uh, let's just say it was pared back. I don't remember all the details, but uh, Kiss was really getting tapped out at that point. Chris, I know we've got to wrap this up in the next five minutes. And before we wrap up, I, I wanted to just get your thoughts or your memories on Big John Hart, who recently passed away. Well, I was very sad, saddened to learn about John. John was, f for almost nine years, uh, in, in many respects, the glue that, that held the band together while we were, were, were on tour uh, here and around the world. I mean, uh, he's somebody that was always a welcome presence. He was somebody that was very even-tempered. Uh, he knew how to be firm but fair. wasn't a person who abused his, his authority. And he was so beloved by all the original members of, of, of the group uh, that he was able to allow a lot of situations that could have erupted into, uh, uh, you know, violence and, 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 and physical uh, uh, manifestations. He was somebody that could calm situations down and, and pull people back. So... It's very sad that that he that he left us, but I will certainly remember uh, him uh, in so many ways as being almost an extension of Kiss because uh, he he helped to keep the band members uh, in line, in the sense that uh, he kept them out of trouble, he kept them away from dangerous situations, and rather than inflame uh, people who were perhaps coming at Kiss in an aggressive way and could be troublemakers. Most of the time, he was uh, very cool and calm and, and was able to diffuse the situation. So he, he really made a big contribution to KISS, and it's, it's, it's a shame that, uh, uh, that, that he left, uh, you know, as, as a, in, a, in a way that was unexpected. Yeah, I think it, it, it shocked everybody. I think, uh, I think everybody has the same feelings about John that you do. You knew him obviously better than many people because you were on the road with him and you saw him, but it, he, he was, he was more than just a bodyguard that you would happen to see in the background. I think, you know, he, he was a, at a level where fans were seeing him like a band member almost. It's funny because I've seen more pictures of John Hart in the last few weeks and I can remember seeing in all the years I traveled with Kiss, these pictures <laughs> came out of the woodwork. So obviously uh, it speaks for itself that he was uh, an extension of the band and, and someone whose presence was, was known and respected and, and, and admired. And that's why you see so many pictures of him. Yep, definitely, definitely. Chris, we want to thank you so much yes. for, for sitting down with awesome. us and sharing some more memories and, and insight into the Kiss machine that you were deeply involved with um it means a lot to us and uh, you know is there ever going to be a sequel to kiss and sell well i uh, uh, no i don't think so because uh i have said everything that i feel that i wanted to say about kiss and it's in that book and of course i'm happy to uh, be interviewed as I've done hundreds of times and appear on television and radio uh, as I did for some period of time after the book was written to 
extend what I had to say in the book, but uh, I, I, I think I did justice to the subject, and I don't plan to. Yes. No, you did. You did. You I did. mean, you know, unfortunately, the book is mm. out of print. But as a, if a fan doesn't have it, you got to go see if you can find Amazing. a used copy somewhere. Yeah. This and Sell by Chris Lent is a must-read book. Into it's the, the gold standard. The the behind the scenes of Kiss. Yes. How it operated as a as a business, which is so interesting so uh once again chris thank you so much for thank, thank you, chris. you michael it was a pleasure and i'm happy to do it anytime and i i really i'm glad that we had the opportunity to connect again today great Thanks, thank you chris. so much take care chris thank you i know i always love having chris on uh, you know he was right there in the trenches through the height of the 70s through the downtime in the the early 80s and through the the mid 80s i mean he saw it i mean and, yeah. and he wrote about it trust me you need to go find a copy of kiss and sell he it's wrote about it. all of this from the behind the scenes perspective it wasn't the who was who who was dating who and you know who was friends with who and what parties did they go hang out. he talked about the business of kiss and how it operated yeah, yeah probably I, the most mature book yes yeah, mm -hmm. to this day, it still stands as that. Yeah, it's a must read. Yeah. And he's and, always so generous of his time like that. Yeah, you know, when when we had um, Elise on last week, it was like, all right, you know, I feel like we want to follow that interview because it was a fascinating interview we had with yeah. her. And Chris was just like the logical, yeah, let's see if Chris can come on and shed some light on, on the Japan tour of 77. And... It's not that he refuted anything because I mean, he's what I love about Chris is he will sit here and go, well, you know, I wasn't in that meeting. I can't say yes or no if that was said, but here's what he knows from that period. So it's not like we were trying to prove anything right or wrong. It's the other side of the story. You know, Elise well, yeah. was the reporter. Chris is coming from the business side of KISS. And, and that's why I thought it was so great of him um, to talk about how hard they were working and, you know, what the, the cyclone they were really in. I mean, think about it. That's how I brought up the point about, you know, Paul writing Love Gun, talking about it on the airplane or even on the tour. Uh, for this song that literally in two months is the title track of the next record mm -hmm. song written, you know, <laughs> demoed, <laughs> played all the other songs, all the artwork, uh, everything that goes involved in that. And it was literally done in, 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 you know, a couple more months. And then they were on tour again. Then they were on tour again, supporting that. And, and, you know, it seems, it seems to me that the, and again, the final answer to a lot of these questions rests with Bill of Coin. We just really won't know. Maybe Gene and Paul, but Bill of Coin's got a lot of the understanding of what was going on operational-wise. But, you know, they recorded, as you said, they fully recorded and finished that live album from Japan. But as soon as Love Gun was finished, I can imagine the band said, you know what, this album is great. We want these songs on the live album, which you, we you ended know, up getting. Makes sense. And then you have a side four of a live two, which is all in new in studio. But that's one thing that's kind of weird too, because a year later, almost to the day, April something, I think is when double platinum came out. One song from love gun on that. And didn't you ever, ever find that odd? I guess I never um, really thought that deeply about it. I was too but busy living odd, my life it? to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know, because let's face it, you know, I mean, shock me was a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't represented on there. I, 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 <laughs> I think what, what I got from Elise and from Chris and which we can now kind of understand looking back, the kiss machine, as we just said, was moving fast and furious and just churning out stuff so what bill said one day 
could have been 100% true that day. Mm -hmm. And the next day, minds have been changed because guess what? Paul sits down and goes, I'm working on this song that's Love Gun, which for the most part, we as fans know is what Paul looks towards the song that best represents Kiss is Love Gun in his mind. He's going to want that on an album. He's going to want to showcase that. If that album was as good as they thought, and you know, we sit back finally talking about Love Gun, things change in the blink of an eye. So it's it's not that it was never said. It's not that it was a lie. It's not that it was some other meaning could have meant fully what Bill said at that moment. And the next morning, it's a completely different situation yeah. with the band. Well, and it's also the same thing in reverse too. If you look at double platinum, <clears throat> all kidding aside, maybe they only put one track on there because it was so close to the release of Love Gun that they started pulling out stuff from the first three records for fans who maybe only had Love Gun or Destroyer or Rock and Roll Over to take them back to the earlier Push stuff. the sales of the earlier albums. Yeah. You know, you know what else is, and, and you guys, let's, let's put our brains together here for the next 30 seconds. Singles that went top 40 in that period, I'm talking from 76, 75, so from Alive, to to double platinum um top 40 singles um peter obviously sang on two of them gene sang two three i'm talking top 40 singles paul's the lead singer what again that's another one of those things i went well, if you think about it, it's kind of weird. I mean, he wrote Hard Luck Woman, but yeah. Peter got Peter got two top 40 singles with his voice. Gene had Rock and Roll All Night, um, um, Calling Dr. Love, and uh, Christine 16. Ace even had one because uh, Rocket Ride, I think, hit 40 as a single um, from Alive 2. Am I missing anything? I mean, Paul I, said, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know loud. enough because, you know, as Tommy said, I was too busy having a life to pay attention to. <laughs> no, but when, when, you say, when, you, when you think about stuff like that, I mean, like the shout it out loud thing, he shared the vocal with Gene. It was, a, you know what I mean? I was, I was too busy getting laid while Mark was paying attention to the charts. Yeah. In 1977. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, 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 and this is a great time to say something because um, it, it rarely happens, but Mark is like, Ron, and I want to showcase this. Sweet. So about a month and a half ago when we were talking about uh, venues playing songs, you know, and we were talking about why is it Ozzy and why is it this and that, and, and you said, well, the Black Veil Brides will probably never have a song that is played in a stadium, but apparently – they are played in a major sports arena in, I believe it's hockey. Uh, and it's Which one? Did, did, did Andy send you this? Yes, Andy <laughs> sent this to me. So I'm going to find it. All right. Because we were having a laugh about that. And I'm mean, like, mean, hell yeah, I'm going to bust his balls about that. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Well, um, while, while, while Tommy's looking, but to your point, Mark, as, as Larry Mazur, you know, said around the revenge era, there's a lot of politics that goes on as to whose songs get released and get promoted to keep people happy. Well, you know, kisses that, that kiss is no exception to, uh, you know, I'll give you a great example. I, again, I'm a, I'm a big queen fan. Those guys used to fight like cats and dogs. Now think about something when you're on a single, I, I want to say that, the Bohemian Rhapsody single, and I'm guessing, I think I'm going, I'm just, again, so if somebody don't nail me down for this, but I think I'm in love with my car is the B side. Well, that's going, that, you know, if you're doing band royalties, that's still on the single. If you follow what I'm saying, yeah. you try and fight to get your song on the single. On the, on even on the B side, even yes, though it's never played, it's sold. It's sold. So, I mean, again, I'm not saying that's what happened with Kiss, but I always thought it was kind of odd that 
you know, eventually, of course, I was made for love you, which turned out to be their biggest song features, Paul. But I'm just talking about in that era that that that, that was, you know, that's something I never asked him. I should ask him that. And I don't know if you give me an honest answer. I wish he would. I, you know, hopefully he does. Uh, I get a chance. I'm going to ask him that. That had to have been weird. You're the lead singer of the band. You're the, one of the primary, if not the primary writer. And you're looking at the and, and I'm just talking about that those years because those are the you know yep. define the classic years you know here's peter with two gene with a couple ace gets a top 40 single you gotta be going damn <laughs> you know what i mean that's uh it's just kind of kind of weird stuff so but uh, okay, you know so I'm go, gonna, go ahead tommy okay i'm gonna read this whole text <clears throat> so andy andy sends me this message listening to your guys new show and michael brings up being at a hockey game and asks whether one day it will be younger bands like black veil brides whose songs are playing and mark says i don't think so ironically the red wings have used our song the last one every time the opposing team scores a goal at their home games and are like for the last five years <laughs> <laughs> the red wings <laughs> I probably don't even know it's them. That's probably why. I'm, I apologize. I, gotta awesome. get with them. I know it's your, it's your freaking team. And you, you, you were either at the game oh, or you were watching the, the game. Yeah. So you were listening. <laughs> and you're probably going, hey, man, this is a great song. <laughs> These guys sound like they could be influenced by Kiss. Yeah. <laughs> hey, by Here's the, the way. Toe by the way, this is what this is what got my my brain thinking. Um, Love Gun only reached sixty one. He's, he's ignoring this You're stuff. Deflecting. You're deflecting. deflecting. I'm not We've deflecting moved on. To the I was I was talking about this. You're the one who deflected off. And look, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know when the other team scores. I don't, I, don't, I I'm not like going, hey, who's that song? Why you just brought up the point that the only song off of Love Gun on double platinum was love gun and you're going to actually get me to believe that you don't pay attention to those songs and go hmm, i wonder why it's not ozzy <laughs> there, hold on to be fair in all arenas that i go to they play bands i don't know who they are but for the most part and look there's I, look i'm sure it's great i'm sure sure it's wonderful i just i've just it's, never really been exposed. no it's just we were having a good laugh about it because it's the freaking red wings as you should Oh, I it's, again. It's, Mar guilty it's, it's Mark's team, and Andy from the Black Veil Brides is texting to say I'm being played at a Red Wings. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna five, for I'm gonna five years, every again. time the opposing team scores a yeah, goal. It, it wasn't just a one-off on a Tuesday night. Oh, it's been on. five years. When the when the opposing <laughs> team scores, I'm looking next to either my wife or my son, and we're complaining about why they fucking let the goal in. I'm not paying attention to what fucking song they're playing. But it's it's called the last time. So it's okay. apropos for the situation. So I now guess you it know. Is. again, I'm now very you need happy to turn for that. to the lovely gonna, Liz and say, I'm gonna you pay know what? I'm going to pay attention next this time. As a matter of fact, next time when I'm at a Wings game and they score and that song's playing, I'm going to text you, Tommy. I'm going to try okay. and, all right. I want you so to stand fair. up in the game and go, hey. I know the guy who's singing this song. <laughs> He's been on my BVB. podcast. BVB. <laughs> All right. I, again, I think it's awesome. I will tell you, they used to play um, that band End Ever After. Do you remember that song? I Want to Be Your Man. That's a fucking great song. They used to play that Joe Louis Arena all the time. That was one of those, you know, that's one. There's a great example of a band that I really dug. They like came and went really fast. But they, they played that song for a couple of years at the Wings game. And I'm like, if you ever get a chance, there's a good song. Man. Check, check out I Want to Be Your Man by End Ever After. They, that was probably 10 years ago. But what a fucking great hard rock album that was. So. Anyways, can we, and, speaking of fucking and, the Wings anyway, around tonight. Anyway, Tommy's so. embarrassed Mark. Mark needs to leave now. Uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> trust me. There, you guys couldn't embarrass me if you wanted to. So. <laughs> Oh, I think there's Ooh. stuff Tommy Challenge has seen in hotel rooms. <laughs> oh no, no. I can I, No, that would be that would be going too far. Yes, but it would embarrass them. It would go too yes, far, but yes, so it would embarrass them. If, if I don't embarrass. Up, no, he, there's he, really he nothing you would, could do to embarrass me. No, he's he'd be proud of it. Okay, so that 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 that's Mark's <laughs> challenge. The homework challenge this week is what could we do to embarrass Mark? Impossible. That it's one of those questions. It just can't be answered. No, I, but seriously, the icing on the cake of that story is it's your team. 
<laughs> I don't, no, that's awesome. Yeah. But again, once the other team scores, I'm trying to figure out why they score. And I'm not paying attention and, and, to anything else. And now you'd be able to hear to to count how many times you get to hear the song every time. I don't want to hear that song, if you know what I mean. You know, <laughs> follow that Freud. I don't want to hear that song because I never wanted to get scored against. Oh, oh what a classic moment. That's oh, a classic it. moment in it's three sides history. All right. Yes. So um homework I, you know i don't know japan 77 we we kind of talked a little bit 77 79 up to the elder even a little bit creatures, creatures. Yeah. you know anything that chris discussed revealed that was news to you yeah i just find it all it's all eye-opening and it all just adds a little bit more to the the story of kiss you know, and I just found it kind of interesting that he just, you know, he was very open and saying, man, if, if we couldn't have, if we wouldn't have done the elder, could have been very different. I think there's a lot of people that thought that. Well, you know, that's a whole which we've had that discussion before, and it's always a good one. You got to go back further than that. It, it's the rock oh, just didn't, st- you know. It didn't start that. That's when it got its worst. That was the lowest. <laughs> and to your point, Mark, maybe they had to be at their lowest point slapped in the face to wake up in order to get creatures could, you know, and that's what I believe that was Tommy's point. That was Tommy's point. Yeah. Yeah, I really have always believed that because if it's as bloated, like we were talking about, then maybe they were just so believing that what they were doing was right. They believed their shit didn't stink. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he, but they we, found we out quickly after we, we would have never story. had we would have never had creatures if there wasn't an elder. Yeah, think I mean, well, think well, Paul about tells it. that story about when they were playing the record for you know people, and he just wanted to sink them, much like he did at the movie. He just kind of wanted to sink in his yep. chair, you know, going, "What the fuck?" Again, it, it, this that's why that that record is so polarizing because you get younger fans that. Have, you know didn't do it timeline wise they weren't, they they weren't there up. when it happened yeah you have no idea how as a kiss fan and of course you know this is put this in context how traumatic it was for a kiss fan at that point when you were following along in real time you're like what the fuck is this well yeah following along in real time you're going at the peak of the mountain in 77 78 and then you're Going down a little bit, you know, you get to Dynasty. It wasn't a bomb, but it was a little bit down. And then on Well, you had to listen to the oh, it's disco stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Remember and that? then you had then you had the oh, that's just what my little kid brother likes. Yeah. That's not a real band anymore. And then Unmasked, which let's be honest, Unmasked didn't tour and didn't do well in the US at all. For, yeah, and then it got even worse with the elder. So as a KISS fan, it was a tough period to remain loyal to the band very difficult and that it's it's no surprise why the creature stage looked the way it did especially in the video um it's funny because i'm looking up at a, a kiss poster there it you know the logo looked like it did in 77 you know what i mean it had the the tank it was more macho it wasn't this futuristic well as, the, as, 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 as we all talk about kiss was just aggressive as hell on the creatures they came out the mindset was right they were kicking ass they were vicious they were angry they were taking no prisoners however you want to describe it but even that didn't secure the band's future they couldn't secure it until they removed all the makeup together completely unfortunately yep Um, so anyway Leave some homework, something related to 77, 78, 79, yeah. 80, 81, something in there. Talk about it. Yeah. Or if you have an idea of something else that may have affected this change from going from super popular to starting to lose it, throw your idea out. Or We'd if you've heard it. the Black Veil Brides played at any other sporting events, <laughs> let us know where. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's just uh, that is that was manna from heaven for me. Uh, you you were waiting to, to to reveal that, right? Oh, we yeah, because Mark, we um, Andy and I talked about this. I don't know 
two, three weeks ago. And I'm just like, I'm just going to wait. Wait for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right. So that's it, everybody. We'll see you next week. So you love the show. Visit threesidesofthecoin.com. Subscribe on YouTube. Follow and rate us on Spotify. Subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. We appreciate your support. For Three Sides of the Coin, provided by LarryDavisVoice.com and by JessicaMarsVoice.com. That's Mars with a Z.